system and things and so on and so forth. So what is ICT? If you look at this, you find that information communication technologies, as many people understand, is just to load their PowerPoint presentations into the computer and make it available for people to see. But that is probably one of the most infantile type of applications that we generally use. But the higher end use always happens to collaboration and also developing very important learning management systems. As told by SBB here at Sri Ramachandra also, we have used the Moodle platform and made quite a lot of changes through our own effort into giving the learning for students. And I will show you a model of that as well. Why do we actually need is because ICT actually allows quite a lot of creativity on the part of both the faculty as well as on the part of the students to interact. It is collaborative and when you establish many MOUs with the foreign universities, this is an area that you should always enter into some sort of an agreement to share practices of ICT and its integration in education. It improves critical thinking and it also helps you to communicate much, much better over a large audience. Here we are struggling with infrastructure for providing 250 students to attend a particular class. But you would find when you use ICT and integrate it, you can even uh, start taking classes for 1,000 to 2,000 students at a given point in time through the synchronous approach. Of course, we are moving more and more from the teacher-centered approach to student-centered approach, and ICT enables this. And teachers have to be becoming more facilitatory than authoritative. This is another slide which uh, I am very fond of projecting that when you allow passive learning as it used to happen during our days and during the traditional curricular practice, students generally, this is proven by literature, they remember only 10% of what they read and 20% of what they hear, 30% of what they see, but when they do, they actually remember almost to the tune of 90%. So we should enable more and more of active learning principles for students to learn. And the basics of ICT when you develop an education, there are different things that can be done. Uh, E-learning, blended learning, classrooms, which uh, many people practice now, e-portfolio, and uh, there was a very good example of what is happening at this PV that was shown earlier. And simulate a based training. We all understand that it is possible. We can um, uh, sort of transmit and make students to learn psychomotor skills and the affective domain. But there is using task trainers and using hybridity simulations, which uh, many people, if you connect it appropriately, you can make students to work from distant sites as well. These are again, the different social media sites that are available for anybody to use them. Of course, e-learning can be defined as the delivery of learning via the use of electronic media. And most of us, uh, tend to now use it uh, some way or the other, even if it is a struggle sometimes. This is an interesting paper and an interesting presentation that happened way back in 2013, where the author had predicted the uh, coming up of International Virtual Medical School. And in my presentation at the end, I would show you an example from literature of the Botswana School of Medicine. Uh, which is uh, sort of practicing almost 80% of their curriculum through online modes. Now, the other important portal that is almost world famous is the Harvard Medical School's uh, online portal. And I'll just show you that if you go into the courses that are available there, you will be able to see that uh, quite a lot of courses can be uh, sort of acquired there. 
university in genetics in basic uh, skills so biochemistry genetics immunology and as you go into each one of them you will be able to see the material and the students can start uh, uh, reading it but many of these efforts have been done uh, even in our country uh, through uh, one minute i think i must go out of the uh oh point yeah so uh, so this type of science gives you so much amount of enormous information and many of the skill learning also happens when you look at these sites more carefully now this is the amc uh, the association of american medical colleges uh, portal uh, which again tries to feature many publications and other details on their particular portal which you can get the full details uh, not only the abstracts but the full details of these areas this is the other one teachmemedicine.org is again uh, it concerns to various specialties like medicine ob gyn pediatric surgery cme uh, even for patient information all these things can be got through these type of uh, websites and web portal so that's another example so why at all online training and online any one of course is this huge covid crisis that has come into being uh, so most of us are very happy with uh, sort of taking our theory classes through that but how far are we um, good at uh, imparting um, patient experience or standardized patient experience to students leaves much to be desired but these are all happening in a regular way in the international arena there will be uniformity of curricular delivery it provides flexibility for flexibility for the learners they can learn it at their own pace at their own time and it ensures quality because almost a similar material is available for all students reduces the and it goes through quite a lot of validation process before it up, appears on a portal reduces the rural urban divide this is an important factor we keep telling in our country that the facilities in a rural area is not as good as an urban area and we keep have to work on this possibility of team learning and collaborative learning is also there and there is also very cost effectiveness to the whole thing these are evidences which support e learning or online learning through systematic meta analytic type of reports in the articles that i have tried to project the point should be considered while designing e learning is at the end of the day the learner should be the central point and the context of what we are trying to convey is also very important the technological aspects are now available through any platform uh, google has its own moodle has it now you people are using zoom so it is possible through many many different mechanisms but we have to um, make certain uh, thoughtful decisions on this and the content of the interventions is rather important and again this framework these principles we should evolve a institutional policy on this in terms of e learning at the same time not forgetting the pedagogical and the andragogical needs that the teacher and the student requires technology of course there are many things that can be possible and these days the computer engineers will do anything for you with artificial intelligence but that is another thing that has to be also taken into account what is applicable to you and what is useful to you is what you have to select then there is this evaluation after doing this there should be at varying points actually finding out how exactly this has been useful and then Uh, managing the whole thing and then the resource support that's given at the end of the day everything that you do should be ethical and we should be able to um, uh, do it in a very ethical manner now this is the moodle portal that uh, ramachandra has developed along uh, for the teaching of all the pre and para clinical subjects and uh, that is anatomy physiology biochemistry which are required not only from the medical students but also for the dental students and all allied health professional students now the oh, yeah. material the e content that is developed that's the most important and that can vary for different programs and different courses so if you go through that uh, particular portal uh, you will 
I definitely see um, that there are, it takes a little while. Yeah. Uh, as you go down, you would see uh, that who is the teacher actually who is going to take a particular class and his content is also put up. The PowerPoints are already put up and even uh, chat discussions and their assessments, everything can be sort of stored under that. So it is not only the taking of the classes, but is complete uh, uh, assessment of the students as well as the complete uh, this thing can be worked out through that. So we have been using this system for the uh, uh, for the last uh, uh, five years, and uh, we have been able to generate quite a lot of data of the students' views towards that. So the advantages of the learning management system, it provides the flexibility in learning for the students. Uh, they need not actually be present uh, through uh, all the classes during the regular hours. Uh, it has its own plus and minus. Increased uh, social learning in terms of uh, sitting with uh, the batchmates and then learning together. Also possible to do independent learning there is quite a lot of support in terms of actually assessing the performance of the students and so on and so forth. Now, uh, Dr. Parija already talked about this. There is this very interesting article of MOOC, is it the future for medical education? The problem when you look at it, as you open online courses uh, or even Moodle, uh, the content is uh, very rich for the technological and engineering programs, arts and sciences but not so much for the medical or the health professions education. Now, this is where we have a huge opportunity and these three months itself has provided great opportunities for many, many medical colleges and many, many institutions to develop extraordinarily good content matter for this. Now, this is a question that many of us will ask. After all, medical education cannot be purely online because there is quite a lot of learning that happens in the hospital on the patients. So right now we do have problems of even having sufficient patients. So in that type of a scenario, we should be able to get into a mode of a blended learning with component of e-learning and classroom training as well. And of course, these we have already discussed the advantages. And this is an important paper which discusses through a meta-analysis of the effectiveness of blended learning in health professions education. See, we don't have to go into other uh, uh, arts and other type of courses, programs, but in health professions education, this definitely is a huge advantage. E-portfolio, sir, already talked about it. It's a purposeful collection of sample student work. You have started even putting the theses and dissertations into your e-portfolio. We have not gone to that stage. And actually, it showcases the student's learning progression. And this, he can keep it as a lifelong record and pull out and show even his grandchildren what he did as a medical student. Uh, it, of course, uh, brings out deeper knowledge. It uh, definitely brings out uh, reflective practice on the students. Uh, it documents quite a lot of achievements and just directed learning makes him a competent clinician. There are definitely some strategies for the successful e-learning implementation. And these are basically in five, six steps. Grounding technology choices. There is so much available right now. If you go to the net and find out, you will really come confused on which best technology that you should use but you should keep your aim as education and academics, the curricular values, the teaching and learning practice that you want to adapt. Of course, thinking critically about the infrastructural needs, both ICT infrastructure and non-ICT infrastructure, engaging relevant partners. This is the most important that I want to stress upon. We had a connection with the Harvard Medical International almost for 12 years. And this enabled us to actually develop an integrated curriculum. And now we find that a lot of such curriculum can be practiced using the online mode. Intentionally engaging the faculty and students, early and continual consideration and sustainability during implementation and integrating continuous evaluation. 
of course there are challenges you have to manage the process you have to manage the user expectations and you have to manage partner expectations as well there are barriers and some solutions most of the time the solutions is faculty development and on the particular digital tools that you are using but we found through an article i was reading i found that there is still quite a lot of skill deficit in terms of understanding the integration as well as the internet technology uh, resources of course sometimes can be barrier because not every institution can afford everything many times the faculty tend to tell that it is the time barrier where is the time but in my opinion the ict should provide more time and more uh, energy for the faculty to use that time uh, critically and more usefully infrastructure can sometimes be a barrier the institutional support is required particularly when they use strategies for asynchronous education because different students learning things at different times and then reporting at different times synchronous of course has already come to stay in the last 3 months almost every institution should be well versed with this this is a particular experience of the botswana school which actually Uh, takes up almost about 800 students per annum and it is a model of decentralized medical education they do it for the residency programs in pediatrics internal and family medicine they have one main center and two rural sites where students from rural sites also go and study there and the partnership with the main and the other international collaborations has made them to have this has started in 2009 it's almost 11 years since uh, that they are running this program and the rationale for e learning is that they have been able to overcome faculty shortages this is a very important for india almost every medical college finds it difficult to have enough faculty but if you start integrating and using ict uh, the faculty shortages can be overcome rural accessibility almost every uh, government proposes that there should be a medical college for a district without uh, uh, sort of enhancing the infrastructure or facility but with this type of a mechanism one major tertiary care center can accommodate and teach people in every district center as well increasing importance of ict in healthcare this was also alluded to by my previous speaker and this is something which has come to stay e health and m health is uh, something which is there and our students should be very well versed with all these methodologies access to teaching learning and assessment this is something you know unless the bandwidth and the internet connectivity is extremely good sometimes this can be very perplexing and this is also an irrational why we want to use e learning uh, of course access to clinical resources is a challenge and it is also one of the reasons how we can do but there are several methods and there are some questions that have also been asked which has been provided to me and during the discussion time we'll deliberate on that and uh, actually it engages active learning so i would just like to end by saying that ict enabled e learning in medical education is feasible it is cost effective and it needs further exploration on the part of every institution it is a collaborative effort between the medical schools both nationally and internationally there should be a lot of uh, even public private partnership to establish this faculty training is the most important crux and when faculty gets trained they themselves will see the advantage of doing this curricular modification can happen at varying points in time and understanding the barriers and challenges to ict will result in what you can ultimately achieve thank you for your attention please thank you so much sir for that comprehensive presentation in fact particularly i was enamored by few points that you had enumerated sir especially the student centric or learner centric then the uniform uniformity is something which all designing medical professionals and teachers have to do that that is very important points and then the botswana school actually concept is very interesting and uh, not even to forget actually the contributions of sri ramachandra institute of higher education research towards e learning has been received very well sir so on behalf of the sb webinar team we extend once again a heartfelt thanks to you we'll move on actually to the next session the next session is by the learner honorable vishnu devi nasar 
She is the Pro Chancellor of Education, International Medical University, and she will be taking us through to some important salient features pertaining to the integration of information and communication technology as exemplified in the ASEAN countries, Association of Southeast Asian Nations. So before inviting Madam, I have the pleasure and privilege of reading out the biodata. She is a first class honors degree in biochemistry from the University of Malaria. She has got a PhD from the University of Cambridge in microbial biochemistry in the year 2000. And a personal note, in fact, my PhD also was in microbial biochemistry. Masters in health professional education from Maastricht University in 2014. She has published several nodal research papers in established journals associated with biomedical sciences, medical education, and supervises research students. She has been awarded the National Outstanding Educator Award University category in May 2018, and also the recipient of the Malaysian Women's Weekly Award, Great Women of Her Time Award for her seminal contributions in science and technology in Malaysia. And her particular areas of research interest are in health profession education as related to faculty development, assessment and innovative teaching learning method. That's very interesting because just a while ago, Professor Vijayaragan actually was talking about the role of ICT in teaching learning and also the travails of uh, extending it to assessment. So we look forward to Dr. Vaishna Devi to throw some light, especially on ICT and assessment. On this note, I invite Madam, please. Yes, thank you very much. So, Vanakam, everyone. So, I'm actually Tamil myself. Vishna, ma'am, uh, you're, ma you, you're, you will have to unmute your all. All right. I am unmute, actually. Can you hear me Vishna, now? Vishna, ma'am, you have been made as a co host. You will okay. have to share your presentation. Yes. Can you see? And you will have to unmute yourself, madam. Yeah, I have unmuted myself. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. You can hear, you can hear me, right? All right. And you yes, can see the presentation? Yes, ma'am. All right. Okay, that's great. So, Vanakam, uh, and I, I, as I said, I'm actually Tamil myself, but I was born in Malaysia, and uh, my parents have history from Sri Lanka, actually, Sri Lankan Tamils. So um, I'm ha happy and honored to be invited and, and to be amongst uh, many esteemed speakers. Huh? So thank you very much, Prof. Shubash uh, from your university for inviting me. And I'm also uh, very honored to be uh, speaking on the same platform with uh, Professor Vijay Raghavan and Prof. Vet Prakash. When I showed this list to some of my uh, Indian expatriate colleagues working in Malaysia, they said, wow, Vishna, you are in a very eminent group. So thank you very much for the opportunity. So I'm going to share with you um, a perspective, not only from an Asian perspective, but also about uh, what we have done in my own university. Now, because I thought that the, the talk was about 15 minutes, so my slides are is, is a bit short, but I'm be very happy to take uh, questions uh, in the chat line after this. So if you have any questions, just put, put it on the chat line, and uh, I will try to uh, take that questions then, right? So if we look at actually what is um, online uh, medical education, right? I think we can, as what the previous speakers have already said, it's actually the use of uh, electronic technology, uh, ICT, to deliver support and enhance both learning and teaching. But it's not just uh, involving communication. It's actually decision-making between the learners and the teachers utilizing online content. Now, having said that, in online learning does provide students with easier and more effective access to a wide variety of uh, high quality information. I use the here high quality because honestly, some of the materials, we don't have to make it. You can actually get it off the net and they are very much of high quality teaching and learning materials. So I see online medical education as a big learning opportunity for students, educators, uh, medical and health professional practitioners, because it's not only the students will learn, we also can learn from online. For example, if you're talking about continuing medical education uh, and you are in a distributed learning setting, so this is an opportunity. So what is online learning? I think uh, Prof. Vijay Raghavan spoke about this just now. It's about participants in active learning. That means you are not a passive learner in online learning. 
And I think this was the biggest challenge schools had when COVID happened because they all shifted to online learning, but both the educators and uh, students were not prepared for this active learning. That means they also must be disciplined. They must uh, turn up on time for these online learning sessions. They must engage in the quizzes, uh, in the chat. So this is something that is very important in online learning. Obviously it's accessible anytime and anywhere. Now this depends on the context, on the bandwidth capacity, which, uh, and I think this is very contextual within countries. Another great thing about online learning, I think is you can learn while you're in practice. So imagine you had students uh, in various communities across, let's say Tamil Nadu, and then you actually need to link them up together to discuss the cases. Then you can actually be practicing in one setting, but communicating with the rest of your class uh, through online learning. So definitely wider network connectivity. So this is an opportunity where, in fact, students in India or students in Malaysia or UK can also uh, communicate and learn from each other. Because online learning is on an online platform and it's the, there is opportunities for us to follow up because there's a lot of evidence and opportunities for, okay, we can set the appointment today, we can have another session later. There's an opportunity to follow up with the learning. And last but not least, and I think this is a very big thing that uh, we need to remember, online learning almost digitizes and captures all the learning data. For, for example, it automatically catches how many students uh, was uh, uh, participating in a session. Even if you ask them to do an online quiz, they automatically captures a student's performance. So in other words, it's actually a big uh, opportunity for big data analysis uh, through online edu education. So it allows for interlinking of domains and actually evidence for us to design future learning. But what online learning has some challenges? I think in medicine, we all must agree online learning is limited in what it can do. Surely all of us do not want to be treated by a doctor who just went to a virtual medical school, right? We want them to go to learn in an environment where they actually have opportunities to even uh, uh, I mean, demonstrate the skills, work with real patients, uh, have empathy. So that's very, very important. Online learning cannot replace face-to-face -face networking, okay? There are some personal data and privacy issues that could arise from online learning. And I think this is also important because it's fast moving and changing. Huh? The online technology is so fast moving and changing. You need to catch up if you go into it. So this is some of the limitations that I think, of course, technological limitations. So for example, a country's infrastructure or a city's infrastructure for bandwidth, uh, Wi-Fi capacity, this can be some limitation. So what is online learning? Definitely the pros is flexible, it's distributed. Uh, you need to actually use good resource and connectivity, but very importantly, and I think Prof Raghavan also talked about it just now, it is based on adult learning principles. So you must be an active learning and it can be personalized to needs and it can be evidence. However, online learning or online medical education is not a cut and paste. So you cannot cut and paste a conventional curriculum to an online curriculum. If you're going to online medical education, you need to design it. You need to make it fit for purpose and understand its limitations. So coming back to COVID-19 and where everybody had this big move to online learning, it, it was a quick solution, right? So that students can progress in their studies. However, they try to cut and paste. So if there was an online lecture, you cut and paste it. If there was an online PBL, you cut and, uh, sorry. If there was a face-to-face -face lecture, you try and cut and paste it. Or if there was a face-to-face -face PBL, you try to cut and paste it to online. You need to know that some of it needs to be specifically designed. And the reason why I say this is, if it's not properly designed, you may also face the risk of online fatigue. So online screen time and students may be lost in the cyberspace. Huh? So 
Here's where I, I'm coming to the challenges in delivery and design for online learning and medical education. So as online learning designers, we need to make sure that whatever we design is matched to the learning outcomes and competencies. We need to consider the resources and connectivity of our students because not all students might be uh, having access to resources and connectivity. In Malaysia itself, in our own university, when uh, the problem arise with COVID, many students went back home to, to East Malaysia and some are international students. We realize that connectivity and resources can really uh, differ. So we need to consider this. Uh, we need to personalize to the learner's needs, make online learning relevant <laughs> to our community needs. We need to align with professional bodies and standards because remember many of these medical courses are based on professional bo uh, body standards. Huh? You have accreditation standards. So changing to online, you need to know what can be changed online and what cannot. So this Whatever is a very- happens, we have to make the radiograph. All right. Okay, so from the learner's perspective, Dr. Vaishali, you need to turn off your mic, mute yourself. Yeah, thank you. So, okay, from the learner's perspective, they also have challenges with online learning. So many of them may not have uh, access to a computer. So for example, we assumed all our students have access uh, to personal computers, but the reality was some students had only their mobile phones as a learning uh, device, right? So they didn't have a personal computer. So imagine asking them to do an online assessment with a mobile phone. So this was a challenge. And there is also a cost. So mobile data, for example, or internet data costs, this is also there. So by going towards online learning, learners also have challenges. And I think another important thing that we forget is readiness and intrinsic motivation. So sometimes students, they are so waiting for us to give information and spoon feed them. So in online learning, they have to be disciplined, as I said. They have to make that timetable because they don't come to campus. You know, There's no one to push them, no teacher to push them. So this can be another challenge. And of course, with online learning, you cannot do the hands-on skills things, right? You cannot do the procedural skills, some of it. Uh, you, you can't do that hospital-based uh, training. So in Malaysia, for example, when COVID-19 hit, for about three months, uh, we were under very strict uh, uh, restrictions. In fact, our students are only going back to the hospitals from this month onwards. So for three months, our students didn't have access to hospitals because healthcare professionals did not want medical students to be there. They, because they were managing a pandemic, they said no medical students. Only from July, when the number of cases in Malaysia has dropped down to less than 10 per day, they have decided this can, students can slowly come in, but with certain rules and regulations. So just to give you that context, right? So... If we do not recognize the risk for poor design and delivery, we actually may have more problems. So a poorly designed online learning experience can lead to gaps in knowledge and competencies, a poor engagement with participants. We may not be meeting healthcare or community needs, maybe not even meeting professional standards. And as one of the participants talked about just now, we may actually have ethical and professionalism issues with online learning. So I think one of the participants, Dr. Ramani, asked question about online assessments and cheating, right? Cheating, I think, exists all the time, even before online assessments. However, by having an online assessment that is not proctored, you are probably opening the door, opportunity for the students to cheat. Huh? So this is something for us to consider. So having described online learning, online medical education, I'm going to take you to the ASEAN perspective, all right? So if you look at our ASEAN region, huh? so these are the countries that are in ASEAN, all right? So I'm from Malaysia. You can see Kuala Lumpur is at the heart there. We, our neighbors are Singapore, Indonesia, Thailand. But you also have Indochina, which is uh, Vietnam, uh, Laos, uh, and Cambodia, Myanmar, Philippines. But just like India, I think where there is a big diversity, we also have diversity issues in 
uh, the ASEAN region. So one of the big diversity issues is in resources and connectivity. So amongst the ASEAN countries, if you comp uh, compare Singapore with the rest of the ASEAN countries, there is a big gap in terms of ICT readiness, uh, internet bandwidth, capacity and devices. So Singapore's solution may not be suitable for the rest of ASEAN countries. The other thing for us to think about, and I think one of the speakers mentioned, subject matter expertise. So for example, Cambodia and Laos, for example, till today still have shortages of medical professionals. This is because in the 70s, 80s, you know, they had uh, problems uh, in the country. So many of the intellects uh, were, were put through these uh, killing fields and all that. So they have problems in subject matter expertise. So they already have shortages in experts. And last but not least, there's a difference in healthcare systems within the ASEAN region. Now, I put this uh, points here because this will affect online medical education. Next point to think about is the governance of medical education. This also differs. So in different ASEAN countries, there are different types of professional bodies, accreditation standards. Some of these ASEAN countries have licensing exams. Some do not. And some countries have both public and private, and some has only public universities. So this is another difference between ASEAN countries. And just like India, there is diversity in socio-cultural context. So all of us actually speak different languages in ASEAN countries. I suppose English is almost the lingua franca, but not as uh, widely spoken. So in Malaysia and Singapore, I think because of the colonial past, we speak in English, right? But the other countries, they definitely people can speak, but the numbers or percentage is not as high. In that way, maybe some of our infrastructure in Malaysia and laws will be more similar to India than the rest of the ASEAN countries. But there is difference in language, religion, political structures, and even disease demographics. Huh? So these are some of the factors that may affect online medical education in the ASEAN region. But there's something very interesting here. About 10 over years ago, we have the ASEAN Mutual Recognition Agreement. Now, this supposedly was to allow doctors, dentists, and nurses to move across ASEAN. Till today, we have not successfully, successfully implemented that. And the reason for that is this diversity issues. Huh? So let me give you one example. So there is disparities in healthcare. So India is here, but I want to highlight more about the ASEAN region. You can see there is disparity in healthcare. Uh, like if you look at hospital beds to physician ratio, there is a big difference within ASEAN, right? There's also disparities in ICT readiness. So some countries actually um, are very much advanced in terms of ICT readiness. So because of mobile phone connectivity, right, and everybody had devices, I think this was a good example with COVID-19 that some of the countries managed to do tracking uh, and uh, giving information to their staff very effectively, right? Another big difference is our uh, governance me uh, measures across ASEAN countries. So for example, medical uh, education uh, licensing exams, uh, across all these different countries are uh, in different languages, uh, different set of examinations, even their duration in medical school also differs. So there is, uh, uh, as expected, because these are different countries, even though we are in one under one economic umbrella, there is much diversity, all right? So the journey to uh, have this um, mutual agreement uh, that, so that people can, work across different countries, especially in health professions, will take some time for ASEAN. But when it comes to online medical education, we have some commonalities, but these two will have to be fit to the context of that particular country's needs, okay? So I think the big question here is, is online medical education suited for future healthcare needs? I mean, if we just think about that, because we're talking about ICT. ICT uh, relates to online learning, okay? So we are talking about the context of online medical education. So why go into it? 
Yes, COVID was a, a pandemic that sort of forced us to go into it. But even before COVID, there were many medical schools who were already into online medical education. And because they were into online medical education, they could transition much faster. Schools that were not into online medical education actually struggled during this period and, and continuing to struggle. So why is there that move? If we think there is a good reason to move, I think there is. I think for ASEAN, definitely there is a big reason to move towards online medical education because it is suited for future healthcare needs. And this could probably be true for all other countries. And in fact, as I said, COVID-19 is evidence that ICT is integral to public health management. So in other words, public health relates to uh, medical education also, right? So we have to train our future health professionals to be ready for these challenges that future healthcare may bring. So then for online medical education, the other related questions would be, what are the ICT resources that are needed? These are very important because I have to say, you need to have the resources. The ICT resources is, is not, the it's just an enabler, right? They power, but the power, the power of online learning actually come from the people, right? So, so you don't even just look at the ICT resources, but you got to look at what are the competencies needed for faculty. And here is the biggest change, uh, challenge we have, the mindset change that, look, I need to work with online uh, strategies. I need to learn to work with machines. I need to use this online technologies to give me data, to improve myself, to improve my students. This mindset change will take some time. And I think one of uh, the speakers, and I 100% agree, we need to think about faculty development and training. Since there are many uh, esteemed speakers here, including vice chancellors, this is the best thing we could do for any university is to support faculty development and training, right? But we don't just assume that it's for faculty. We need to think about what are the competencies needed for the students. Surely what we need is for the students to know how to use these resources. There is this assumption that they are digital natives, you know, that these digital natives, they can adapt very, very fast to online learning. To be honest, this is, I think, a myth, you know, because they are used, they are digital natives in certain aspects, but they are not digital natives to online medical education. Remember, medical education has a lot of competencies. ICT competencies is just one of them. So if you are thinking that you want to train that future medical student to be a reflective practitioner and to use the e-portfolio for that reflective practice, you don't assume just because they are digital natives, they can learn to do it. They must first understand the principle of reflective practice. Why is that important for improving their personal skills? So this is what I'm saying that we need to, the online learning is just an enabler, the tool, but the people, the faculty the, is, are the drivers to help the students see the needs and identify the right competencies. So I'm going to share with you next what we have done at our university and also in some of the other universities like in Singapore and Indonesia that I, I collaborate with to make that transition to online learning. So for example, when you're talking about ICT resources, you cannot talk about online learning without having a learning management system. It can be Blackboard, Moodle, you know, whatever platform you need to have it. You need to have these webinar platforms and again, there's a wide array out there, or in fact, have customized solutions. So for our online assessments, we have a customized solution, in fact, with an Indian company. So they have actually uh, customized our assessments to fit an outcome-based curriculum. Each time our students complete an assessment, online assessment, they get almost feedback on their uh, um, uh, learning outcomes and performance. Uh, based on that exam. So I think this actually personalized learning to the students' needs, all right? 
here are some of the things that we have done in the interim. So for lectures, for example, we have synchronous, asynchronous, we can actually do PBLs. We in fact have some of the skills-based session online also, but if some of them cannot be done online, we actually bring forward to the next uh, semester, all right? And then we also have online assessments, all right? So this, you can ask me questions later. Now, I just want to show you about on clinical skills and communication skills that can be delivered online. So what we have done is we looked at the outcome domains, for example, communication and history taking. What kind of online learning session can fit uh, communications and history taking skills. And we have taken a constructivist approach where it's a student-centered approach. Again, I'll be happy to share these slides with you, but I'm just taking you through some of the outcome domains. So reasoning and decision-making skills. This is some of our online learning uh, strategies. And this is the reason why we uh, chose this strategy. So you can see the three columns actually explains what are the domains, uh, what is the online learning session, and what is the student-centered approach that we have taken? Having said that, while most physical examination and procedural skills cannot be done online, but by using virtual or augmented learning tools or demonstration of skills like suturing, huh, using a fresh chicken tie, for example, I suppose for vegetarians, it might be a problem, but these are some of the strategies we have used for online learning. And then we also justify it in terms of the student-centered approach, all right? So I hope I've shared with you just very quickly some of the strategies we have taken, right? And I just like, this is my final slide as a take-home message. I'd be happy to take questions uh, uh, through the chat line. First thing is online medical education must meet healthcare needs. So whatever we do and redesign it, it needs to meet the healthcare needs of whichever situation or context. So I am not a believer of Harvard's curriculum to be suitable for my country, for example. I think we need to design our curriculum based on our healthcare needs, right? We need to make sure there's accessibility and engagement in online learning because it's not a one-way process, it's a two-way process. We need to make sure there's no cut, copy and paste. You design for needs, yeah? Design medical education learning for purpose and context. Understand that online learning is fast moving and changing with limitations. And last but not least, we need to be very agile and be ready to adapt. Because as you can see, at least with COVID-19, for countries that think they have managed it, they are having second uh, surges and spikes and there might be a period, unfortunately, of you know restriction and then lifting. So we all need to be agile and ready to adapt. So thank you very much. Uh, and I think as you say in Tamil, Nandri. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, madam. Your observations were discerning and I think a particular mention must be made of the challenges that you envisage, especially with reference to delivery and design. This is something that all educationists should certainly take cognizance of that and act accordingly. The diversity of ASEAN nations it is a point actually that comes before. I think that has also been well received. And also let's hope the ASEAN mutual recognition agreement comes to force and uh, that will alleviate probably a lot of problems encountered in ICT. Having said that, I want uh, really uh, emphasize once again the point that uh, the transition actually it, Online learning has its own merits and demerits. I think we'll have to take cognizance of the merits and probably convert the demerits. In fact, a lot of questions are there, a plethora of questions are pouring in still. So, with the permission actually of Madam as well as the other three learned speakers, we'll consolidate other questions and get back to the learned speakers. Then we'll make a compilation and through the SBV Digital Council SBV webinar, we share it, Madam. So, this is one we talk largely because of the paucity of time and also the uh, galaxy of questions that's pouring in, still pouring in. On that note, we thank Professor Nadrajamar once again. We'll move on to the session for last session for the day. That is challenges confronting integration of information communication technology in online medical education. And we are very happy to have the erudite scholar, the teacher par excellence, and also the BC Rai awardee, Professor Ved Prakash Ganga Prashad Mishra, 
and it's my pleasure and honor as well to tell a few lines about sir though everybody knows that he doesn't require any introduction we are proud to state that actually is the most honored and cherished member of the board of management besides he is also a board of management member at dy patel vidyapeet and enna university and he has the uncanny ability if i can be permitted to use the word to communicate effectively and conveying dissenting information actually in a very palatable manner this is one thing i really envy of sir if i am once again permitted to use the word and he has been doing that so well and he has been actually a forerunner sir is a member of the international committee for bioethics for asia pacific region he is he was the chairman of the national coordination committee for nmc bill 2017-18 which made cardinal changes and because of his erudition actually it is not a surprise that he has been the recipient of several awards mentioned must be made of the best orator of the year award institute institute of science nagpur the vigyan jyoti award conferred by society for national integrity and modernity new delhi in september 2010 He has authored a report on the initiation of choice-based credit system in with reference to medical education. This is something phenomenal because, as all of you will agree, the choice-based credit system, as mandated by UGC, assumes a lot of relevance, especially pertaining to the academic flexibility, which is bestowed actually the deemed to be universities. So, sir, actually has made a lot of noble contributions in implementing academic flexibility. in the domain of medical education sir actually has also got a lot of copyrights he is an avid participant in intellectual property and then he has got four more process actually uh, in the, the the registration with the competent authorities the jewel in the crown is obviously the bc rai national award for the year 2016 bestowed on him as an eminent medical teacher so we are really delighted and honored to have such an eminent person actually in our portal sir please welcome Professor Ved Prakash Mishra to share his views on the challenges confronting integration of information and communication technology, sir. Thank you very much, Professor Sri Nivasan. It is indeed with great privilege and humility I deem it my pleasure to participate in this webinar. the initiative of which has been taken by my learned brother and the honorable vice chancellor of prestigious balaji vidyapeeth dr subhash parija i record my sense of gratitude for very erudite and learned disposition made by honorable dr shri vijay radhavan learned vice chancellor of ramchandra institute university made by learned professor learned lady professor vishna devi in a very exemplary and a definitely impactful manner i would like to record my appreciation for the university for the initiative for really undertaking a very vital theme and putting across the various faces and facets of it for discussion all the three learned erudite speakers in their dispensation have covered various challenges pertaining to the integration of ict in the domain of education including the medical education in their own way and therefore i stand facilitated to a very great extent i am not just wanting to repeat the challenges which have been put across by them subscribing to all of them as a matter of material reality we need to understand it is not just the covid situation which has compelled to think on these lines although there is a thought across the globe that perhaps it is the covid pandemic which has compelled us to think about the entire fresh look at the contextual reality of the medical education program but let me admit very frankly competency based medical education i had the privilege of formulating as chairman of the academic council of medical council of india and i have no hesitation in putting across the work which was started in the year 2015 completed in 2017 finally with due processing by the various authorities and bodies including the competent authorities came to be implemented in the year academic session 1920 except for the fact that facilitatory mechanisms on virtual mode have been incorporated in the in, in the entire competency based medical education draft or the model you may call 
but it has not and i i admit very frankly we had not envisioned a sense of online medical education therein and therefore if it is a fallibility i admit that fallibility but it was not conceived and therefore the present competency based medical education model as has been structured and as it has been put into vogue into operation from the academic session 1920 ladies and gentlemen it only provides for facilitatory mechanisms in terms of various tools and techniques of ict to be incorporated appropriately and adequately with reasonable flexibility which is available to the teaching institution including the examining university but to say that there is a model which is incorporated therein as a as a key author of that particular document i refrain from making that tall statement having said so it is true that it is the covid pandemic and the challenge which has been put across has definitely made all of us think on these specific lines and therefore i say these thought which we are wanting to work out is going to be a real plethora of understanding for the purpose of honing down to structuring something which is much needed not only for the purpose of tidying over the situation but maybe also from the point of view of really working out the same for the future usage and utilization of the of the model of medical education it is true there was a time in early 80s when e stood for evolution of e and that is electronic evolution late 90 early 90s it was contemplated as e revolution and finally it got converted into e education and that is exactly the text which we need to keep in mind it is the advent of technology it is the rapidity with which the scientific and technological advancement in the domain of communicative technology informational technology took place which very rightly pointed out by dr vijay raghavan ultimately resulted in globalization dr parisa very candidly brought about with the withering away of the geographical boundaries it is the information explosion and the integration by the information communication and technology that the entire world has been unified the concept of maximum coming true that it is not the village which is a globe but it is the globe which has been converted into a small tiny village therefore the question of scope of virtual education or online education in any domain including medical education cannot be said to be out of context but yes as very rightly focused by the learned speakers also there are definitive challenges and therefore i am wanting to bring out certain specific challenges which i see in the national context number 1 i put and i use a phrase which i call as digital divide if you really take into consideration the biggest challenge that we are contemplating today with reference to india it is the digital divide what is the scenario i am just reading a small paragraph in order to bring out the reality of this digital divide and perhaps that should be acting as a real real eye opener for us and this is the evaluation which has been done after the midterm appraisal of the 13th five year plan and i am reading that particular report which very categorically brings out that according to this report only 15% of the households have access to the internet as on day mobile broadband remains accessible to very few that is only 5.5 subscriptions for every 100 people further the reach of broadband in the country is just about 600 corridors which is restricted by and large to the top 50 to 100 indian cities and leaving very wide areas uncovered and being played by poor connectivity or this is the contention which i am wanting to put across the digital divide in terms of the availability of the bandwidth itself is a huge problem which cannot be lost sight of and therefore keeping this in mind i take you to another digital divide again very rightly referred in by dr vijay raghavan the present day learner and the present day operators of education be it the faculty or be it the other associated persons there is a huge digital divide this generation plays with technology and we are learning on technology and therefore it is that gap very rightly put in by ma'am that it is the faculty development program which is expected to be bridging the gap but frankly speaking the gap is huge the gap is big and therefore small little efforts will perhaps not be in a position to bridge that gap 
that easily and it is going to be a time consuming affair that i take as a second important challenge which i think i think that it is going to be really confrontative in character the third important challenge which i am wanting to focus is true that if you take into consideration the reorientation of medical education or when we talked about the medical education for the century the very critical part of the opening sentence itself in regard to the role of the faculty when we said no more a sage on the center stage but that transition now has gone a step further and if i am required to put up in the same parable that particular transition i will say now it is a cyber guide by the side it is this transition which is required to be worked up and therefore this transition is not expected to be that handy that speedy that miracle like mechanism which will be able to make that transition go it is therefore i am saying plagued by definite degree of ordeals plagued by definite degree of difficulties plagued by different degrees of limitations and very rightly said it is also required to be revolutionizing a change of the mindset to accept this acceptance and adaptability of the new dimensions which are expected to be putting across if you really take into consideration the development of online education in america it provides you a chronological model for that and therefore the challenges discovered out of that can be very easily inter can very easily be interpolated with the situation that we are required to be putting across if you take the usa model it was in the year 1990 and for a period of 10 years the first phase that can be taken across it can be said to be internet propelled distance education medical education was untouched out of this particular proposition even in united states of america it was in the year second phase that is 2000 to 2007 where it was called as increased use of learning management systems it was this dimension ladies and gentlemen which percolated down to as a cascading mechanism into medical education system in united states of america the third period that is 2008 to 2012 which was a phase of massive open online courses massive open online courses ladies and gentlemen have been more availed for continuous professional update in the developed country rather than being incorporated in the system in a, in that format in terms of be it undergraduate medical education post graduate or even for that matter specialized medical education but yes presently the situation that we are facing it has definitely brought us and it has compulsively made us to think that indeed a model of blended learning is inevitable and perhaps that is the need of the future times to come i am not touching about the justification i am not touching about the need i am not touching about the scope i am not touching about the mandate but yes it is the policy frame ultimately which is going to govern this particular situation as i told you the competency based model of medical education in terms of policy did not entail a definite quantum of online medical education blended with it it was a facilitatory proposition which has been incorporated therein therefore ladies and gentlemen yet another challenge will be how exactly this online medical education its extent its usage its utility its scope has to be put into an appropriate policy frame institutional usage for the purposes of augmentation and upgradation is one part of it but in a huge country like ours wherein we are required to be governing nearly 600 medical schools today in order to bring a model on par with the standard uniformity it is the policy framework which will be mandated that frame that framework in the context of impoverished funding for the purposes and cause of medical education and that particular policy frame impoverishment in the context of material resource availability and a divide in terms of resource availability resource usability and resource facilitating mechanism within the country itself it turns out to be yet another a huge challenge for the purposes of invocation of balancing and leveraging the situation in its entire gamut and therefore ladies and gentlemen what i am really wanting to focus and bring about is 
true. Blended learning is the need of the hour. What is feasible and permissible and tenable in terms of contextual realities vis-a-vis -vis the competencies to be generated, they will have to be structured and then they will have to be incorporated in the curriculum for which very rightly pointed out by ma'am that faculty update and the learner's competency identification, they will have to be incorporated into the system for setting out and rolling out a real curricular agenda for that particular blended learning. Today, the blended learning in its realistic manifestations as it ought to, which we are envisioning, is not incorporated in the model that has been put into trial. And imagine that model is right now at the stage of its first year. It is only the first year of that particular model which has been put into your implementation. There are still three, three and a half years more for the purpose of first batch to come, come, batch to come out of that particular model. And it is in that context that by itself incorporating an interim change which is perhaps even inevitable to be brought into the system with initial process having already taken place and midterm alteration and record being taken that too turns out to be a huge challenge which needs to be diligently thought about. Apart from the capacity building, apart from the infrastructural proposition, apart from the technological support, apart from the orientation of the people to operate on, and apart from the curriculum design and other incidental realities which are materialistic to any academic program and any academic model, ladies and gentlemen, there are bound to be operational difficulties which we come across. And therefore, stock of those operational difficulties in the form of a challenge, they have to be envisioned for the purposes of invocation of strategic anticipation to tide over them. Likewise, there are expected to be economic challenges pertaining to the same, which cannot be just worked out in only in terms of the policy. It would neither be open nor permissible for any, any institution or any university to take up the entire onus of providing or tidying over the digital divide which is plaguing the situation. Therefore, it is the government policy which has to be blended with it. It is the ICT policy of the government. It is the medical education policy of the government. It is the digital divide coverage policy of the government which will require, require alteration in the public funding for the in terms of visualization of new prioritization for the same. It is this newer prioritization and the perception of that newer prioritization, including in the context of grave economic recession, which is expected to be generate out of, generated out of this pandemic across the globe, also turns out to be a huge challenge which cannot be lost sight of. Moreover, it is classically said, the real challenge is technological. Even if today, by virtue of the infrastructural dispensation, you work out to bridging the gap that exists today, the rapidity of the advancement of technology is so huge, so rapid, that it is classically said in the domain of technology, including to be used in the educational domain, what is relevant in the morning turns out to be obsolete in the afternoon. In such a scenario of the paced development of advent of technology every day, Keeping pace with it in terms of funding and parallel prioritization turns out to be yet another challenge which is not easy to tackle. And lastly, which I'm wanting to put across, other than the economic challenges and policy framework, there is yet another dimension. Very classically put in, why is it that the entire gamut of medical education could not be made online even by the most advanced, technologically advanced countries? Basically, because there is a basic dictum which cannot be forgotten. Medical education has to be high tech, the lesson learned, but high touch, which is a mandatory requirement of the medical education, cannot be lost sight of. And therefore, if I am to put across in one word as to what I am wanting to connect or connote out of my entire dispensation, including tidying over the challenges, is to my understanding, the blended learning ideal model that we are required to be envisioning in terms of working out strategic tidying over of the challenges which we face is it has to be a high tech and a high touch model. High tech inevitably necessary, but high touch inevitably mandatory. It is this joining of hands, it is this integration which alone will be in a position to really make out 
what we are wanting to be aiming out of invocation of a system of medical education in the larger interest of catering to the cause of legitimate expectations of the people at large through a meaningful, cogent, and credible public health care delivery system. Yet another dimension which in terms of the challenge I am wanting to put across. Ladies and gentlemen, history is one thing which cannot be forgotten because it gives us lessons. Remember, there was a, we have a human history of invasions and those invasions were ultimately capturing the empire. The strategy altered with the passage of time. It got converted into colonialism. The history bears a testimony to it. History further changed. It got converted into economic imperialism. And last but not the least, let me permit to say so, if the entire education is expected to be put across on technology, take it for granted, the day is not far where the world will be plagued by yet another colonialism, which will be educational imperialism. That is yet another challenge which cannot be lost sight of. And therefore, ladies and gentlemen, other than the operational challenges, other than the structural challenges, other than the functional challenges, other than the technological challenges, other than the policy frame challenges, other than the challenges of capacity building, even the concept of economic imperialism, which is on the offing, cannot be lost sight of. And that is also one of the important threats which we need to be always keeping in the back of the mind whenever we are talking about. But in conclusion, if I am to advocate one thing, yes, as the key author of the competency-based medical education, I have no hesitation in saying there is a need of blended model of invocation of medical education in our country with support from all concerned, including generation of the cogent evidence for the purposes of appropriate incorporation in terms of our need, relevance and context including creation of the systems for that particular purpose for which a blueprint is necessary and I am working on generating that blueprint for the purposes of further update of the competency-based model of medical education into a blended model of medical education incorporating the thematic part therein as that the core of the soul of that particular model ought to be high-tech high and high-touch model. Thank you very much for patient listening. God bless you all. I seek permission of Dr. Parija because Dr. Parija, I have to join another webinar at 4 o'clock. Therefore, I seek the permission from you uh, to, to join the webinar. I would not be in a position to continue further. Uh, the questions which are there, they can be pulled. I would be too happy to answer them on my mail and communicate them for the information of all concerned. Kindly bear with me and kindly grant me that permission. Thank you so much, sir. As one of the participants in remarked, it has been really a passionate speech delivered actually with a lot of zest and all your wisdom and experience that, have, that you have mustered over the period of time has culminated in this excellent presentation. And particularly, I take cognizance with your permission, your concept of the digital divide and also the acceptability and adaptation actually that has to come into place and also the considerations that are in vogue as regards MOOC courses and also your concept of blended learning and how it is going to come to stay in the years to come. Thank you so much, sir. And I now request actually Professor Padmavati, who is the Vice Principal of Mahatma Gandhi Medical College Research Institute, a constituent college of Sri Balaji with Pit, and she's also on the SB webinar team. And I'm requesting her to propose a formal vote of thanks. Namaste. I'm seeking your leave if you don't mind. With the blessings of our Honorable Chancellor, Shri M. K. Rajagopalan, I, Dr. Padmavati S., propose the vote of thanks on behalf of the SBB Connect team. I thank our Honorable Vice Chancellor for giving us a golden platform for organizing this webinar series. My sincere and heartfelt thanks to our eminent speakers, Honorable Professor Vitrakash Mishra, 
Honorable Professor P. B. Vijay Raghavan, Honorable Professor uh, Vishna Devi Nadraja, and Honorable Professor S. E. Parija for enlightening us on today's topic. My warm thanks to all the participants with whose participation this event turned into a great success. I thank all the members of SBV Digital Council, administrators and IT team for rendering a solid support in organizing this online event and making it a grand success, which will be long remembered by the discerning minds. Thank you. Everyone, Nandri Vanaka. We are glad to announce our next meeting of SBB Connect webinar will be hosted on the month of August 2020 on 19th. And we want to announce that every third Wednesday, we are organizing SBB Connect every month. Thank you one and all for joining us.